make disciples. And for the last over two years, <laughs> we have been trying to understand and learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Guess what we're going to do today? We are going to finish that series on going and making disciples and the series that's come out of the Gospel of Mark. So we end with the concluding words. And the interesting thing is we're going to end kind of where we began. Mark's gospel was given to us to go and make disciples. And how does Mark end? Go and preach the good news. Go and preach the gospel. Go and preach to all the world, to all nations, to all people. In fact, to all of creation. By the way, when you see that in the text, just take note. It's an intentional that Mark put in there, all creation. Because if we're out there <laughs> preaching Jesus Christ, making a difference in our world, guess what? Not just our humans going to be different, but creation is as well. In fact, the word tells us that creation is waiting, hurting, in pain, waiting for Christ to come back and to redeem this whole world. Even creation is bothered by sin. Are you aware of that? So today, we're going to be finishing up our two-year study, as I'm saying. <clears throat> In the end of Mark, it says that God confirmed the proclamation of the gospel, the preaching of Jesus, that God confirmed that with signs and wonders, through faith and miracles. And question, does God still perform miracles today? In January, I believe it was, we prayed here for Peter, G Peter Giacoletti, our treasurer. Pete had gone into the hospital, had almost died, and he had a leak inside his abdomen. And they said that that was going to continue to leak and he was gonna potentially die within days. Literally days, two, three, something like that. We prayed here for Pete that God would seal that leak. The following week, the leak was sealed and no one knew how. Well, shouldn't somebody know how? We prayed for God to seal the leak, and God sealed the leak. Have you noticed, though, that sometimes the things we pray for don't happen like we want them to? We prayed for a leak, it was healed. Peter went on to say, Bill, something even more amazing than that happened. When you come to the memorial, I'll tell you what. Something more miraculous than that. And what I love it about it is that Peter was a guy who really... He was an engineer, he was an intellectual, he chose to believe in God, he didn't have any kind of emotion behind it, it was simply, I've got to do it because I'm not getting all my questions answered, I'm never going to get them all answered, so I'm just going to choose to believe. The supernatural was not quite what he, was common for him. And when he said, Bill, I experienced an even greater miracle, that was that, just his saying that was a miracle for Peter. But God didn't heal Peter, did he? He took him home. Yet in the final days that, that Peter was alive, God answered some of his prayers. And one of those biggest prayers he, he, that Peter had was that he would be able to present the gospel one more time to his granddaughter. God did better than that. He had his granddaughter read the book six times to Peter in the last days that he was alive. And there was that little book there, the, the answer book on, on, on Christ. And, and that little answer book talks all about how do you come to believe in Jesus, who is Jesus, all that kind of stuff. And he had her read the book to him. And she kept reading that book even when he was no longer really conscious. And he was getting an answer to his prayers. Now his biggest prayer is still that she'll make that final commitment too to Jesus Christ. But boy, Peter, when he couldn't even talk, was presenting the gospel to her in an amazing way. Mark 16, verses 15 to 20. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 
Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it. It's the message, the great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. How did Jesus say it in Matthew 28? Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Luke says it this way in chapter 24, verse 46. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Mark says we're supposed to go preach. Jesus says we're supposed to go preach. By the way, who's that supposed to, supposed to do that? Only people who are paid. Everyone. Every Christ follower is supposed to go and preach. The word caruso, to preach, means to do the work of a herald, a, a public proclamation. We proclaim openly something which has been done. So if something good has just happened, so I was trying to get the kids to share, right? Share something good that has just happened. That's, that's what preaching is supposed to be, sharing something good, proclaiming it out loud, telling the truth, letting other people hear good news. People, however, may not think that our good news is good news for him. We kind of heard that in the kids this morning too, didn't you? <laughs> your, your son who said, I'm sad school's over. <laughs> and so what might sound like good news to one person may not sound like good news to somebody else. And boy, doesn't that happen. Has, hasn't preaching kind of gotten a, a negative word? In fact, I actually found this in the dictionary. It says, I think preaching, by the way, has gotten a bum rap. We don't want people talking down to us, and yet where do we stand when we're preaching a sermon on a Sunday morning? Up higher, you're seated, you're down below. We don't like somebody talking down to us. We don't want somebody to attack us. And, and we, a lot of us don't even want somebody telling us what to do. I didn't get any amens on that. Here's the negative sense of preaching. It's to give moral advice to someone in an annoying or pompously self-righteous way. Viewers want to be entertained, not preached at. Synonyms for preaching, to moralize, to sermonize, to pontificate, to lecture, to harangue, informally, to Preachify. Who are you to preach at me? <laughs> it's gotten a negative term, hasn't it? But I'm not surprised, are you? Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Preaching should touch our hearts. It may actually and should even call us to a sense of repentance. There ought to be a sense of conviction. And may I just put in a parenthesis on that, that any preacher who doesn't preach to themselves probably is pontificating. Matthew 10, 7, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. 
the disciples, they're going out, Matthew 10. They're sent out, 72 of them, two by two. And what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to say, hey, the kingdom of heaven's here. You guys have got good news. And what is he really saying? Jesus is here. God has come. An amazing thing is happening right in front of our eyes. You guys, come on. It, there ought to be that kind of excitement that we have when we're going to preach and invite the world to become Jesus' disciples. Luke 8, 39. Return home and tell how much God has done for you. Man has just been healed. And Jesus says, go tell them. Just tell people what God's done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for them, had done for him. That's, that's what preaching ought to be for us. We should be going out in this world and simply saying what God did for us. By the way, watch out. If you go to a restaurant today, and you complain about having walked out during, during worship today. You know, something that the pastor preached that you didn't like or the songs you didn't like or something like that. Because, you know, the world's listening out there and they'll hear the negative much louder than they will the positive. 1 Timothy 3.16, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. This is the mystery. He, Jesus, appeared in the flesh was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up into glory. That's a summary of what happened with Jesus Christ. Eileen shared a uh, prayer request this last week. She wrote, John, my co-worker, is Jehovah's Witness. He believes Jesus was an angel, actually Michael, brother to Lucifer. Pray for truth and a soft heart. The world may not like it when we say that Jesus is the way to God. But Ezekiel 36, 26, 27, the verses I gave you last week, I'm going to remind you of them again. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Folks, go preach. Get out of here. Go preach to the world. Do it if you'll go preach. <laughs> go preach. Tell the world about Jesus. Tell the world what Jesus has done for you. Let the world know how much Jesus loves them. Go preach. And let people see Jesus in you. And you may need to pray that God will give you a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone so that you're ready to really love and care about them. Mark goes on, verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. This is one of those words people don't like. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Whoever chooses not to be with God for eternity will not have to be with God for an eternity. But the sad thing about that is it means they will be condemned to be away from him forever. They'll be condemned to the darkness. They'll be condemned to a place that God doesn't want us to go to. And that's the bad side of it. Jesus said, believe. To believe means to think to be true, to be persuaded or to credit, to place confidence in something. Do we have our confidence in Jesus Christ? When we go out into the world, do we believe that Jesus is going there with us? Acts 4.12, Peter and John are standing in front of the Sanhedrin. They've been arrested. They're getting in trouble. They want them to stop talking about this Jesus guy. And Peter responds, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. Now watch out. Church, some of us have loved ones who don't know Jesus, and we've started developing a theology that is not biblical. And the theology is, you know, well, maybe they'll all get there anyways. And we hope, we hope that they will get there. And some of us are really concerned because we, we have family members who are, who are this close to, to that point where they either go to heaven or they don't. 
in a, in a world, the world continues to teach a theology that says, you know, but everyone will be able to get there somehow. It, basically, if we're just good enough. Now, who decides who's good enough and who's not good enough? I believe it is Jesus, and his good enough was be perfect as I am perfect. And if you can't be perfect, then you need to accept his payment. John 14, Jesus said it this way. When getting the disciples ready for his death, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. How? But through me. I like to remind people that there's only one road to get to the uh, north rim of the Grand Canyon. How many of you have ever been there? It's a beautiful, beautiful place, right? But there's only, did you know there's only one road in there? You go down that road, and there's certain times of the year you cannot get down the road because there's too much snow. What a shame. There's only one road to get to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. We should all protest that. We should get angry about the fact that there's only one road. Instead, what, what, what do we do? We should celebrate the fact that there is a road that you can get to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Unless you want to hike down and hike back up the other side, you can actually get there by car. We should celebrate that fact just like we should celebrate the fact that there is a road to heaven and it's through Jesus Christ. Paul and Silas had been arrested. They're in jail again. <laughs> And this time, in the middle of the night, the angel comes, breaks off their chains, opens the doors to the, to the prison, and the jailer realizes that the, the doors are open, and he's like, I'm dead. So he's about to take his own life. And Paul says, he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And how do we get salvation? Not by being good enough, by believing in Jesus. And so I just ask you again, do you, do you personally believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and now his spirit lives within you? Do you believe that he died to pay the payment for your sins? Have you accepted his forgiveness? Do you believe he's opened up heaven and a pathway for you to get there through him? Do you believe in Jesus? Because if you do, then watch out. Because we have responsibility. Because you see, belief naturally leads us to obedience. When you believe someone, you do what they say. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. What did Jesus say in his great commission? Let me take you back there again. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And what? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Belief naturally leads us to obedience through, by the way, repentance. Have you felt the conviction of the Spirit of God that says, hey, you're not obeying? Didn't we, in order, most of us, to come to Christ, had to walk through repentance, had to walk through that time of conviction, that sense of, God, I don't think I have things right with you. God, please forgive me. Belief leads naturally to repentance and obedience. And folks, this is good news. There's a way for salvation. But unbelief leads us to condemnation. And that should break our heart. When we walk out there and drive out there and spend time out there, our hearts should be breaking for people that we are getting to know, the people in our oikos, the people that we spend time with, the people that are our neighbors, uh, that they go into the post office with us, they, they go into Goodwins with us, uh, they drive down the street beside us. Those, they ought to start, our hearts should start to be broken for those who are not on their way to heaven. Mark goes on, verse 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, 
They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. Matt jumped at verse 20. And then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So I've got a rattlesnake here and I wanted to see who wants to get bit. Okay, well, how many of you have drank, drank coffee from over there this morning? And <laughs> Too bad, folks. We're testing the poison to see what... <laughs> But um, so, so maybe you didn't, don't want to uh, hold snakes. Maybe you don't want to drink poison. But you're not, you don't have a problem with casting out demons and praying for healing of the sick, do you? Demons, not do you? Demons, things here that are just a little bit extraordinary, aren't they? Just slightly unusual. And I, I need to say, I don't think that this is a prescription that we're supposed to do. I don't think that God was saying, okay, you all need to start gathering together with the snakes and see if they bite you and, they, and if you die or not. Okay, drink the poison. Then you'll see if the Kool-Aid kills you or not. <laughs> By the way, everybody who drinks does die. Just going to warn you about that. So if you stop drinking, maybe you won't die. I don't know. But everybody who drinks dies. I'm talking about anything. I'm not talking about just one thing, okay? Although caffeine does have its issues. I don't think that this is a prescription. I believe it's prophetic. I think that Jesus is saying this, and he's saying, look, things are going to happen. I'm not saying that everybody will be casting out demons or that everybody will be speaking in tongues or that everybody will be healing the sick or that everybody will be bit by snakes or that everybody will, be, will live if they get, eat, drink poison. But I am saying that it's going to happen. And I would also caution us that there are some who would say those things only happened in the first century and now they don't happen anymore because the Holy Spirit did everything the Holy Spirit needed to do to call people to him. And so he stopped doing all miracles and stuff like that. I don't think you'll find that anywhere in Scripture, folks. I don't think that you'll find things limited in Scripture that we may have limited by our theology. Be careful. Signs and wonders will come to you if you believe and follow Jesus. The word means that they will follow you. And this is an interesting term, that these, these signs and wonders are going to follow wherever God's people go. This, that's kind of a cool image if you think about that, right? Now notice, it doesn't mean that you're going to go out there and make them happen. But as you're going out there and living for Jesus, as you're going out there praying with people and for people, signs and wonders are going to occur. I still remember the day I was talking with Dennis Labadee, who is now no longer with us. And the day that I was standing there and praying for him as he was getting ready for surgery, and he and Rose Weekend both said, wow, we could feel the power when you were praying. Well, yes, because I'm praying to Jesus Christ. Then he has power, and signs and wonders ought to follow us. If we're actually going out into the world and doing the work of Jesus Christ, then the power of God is going with us. Incidentally, you don't even have to ask for the power to go with you. Because Emmanuel already promised to be with you. The power of God is already resident there within you because Jesus Christ lives in you. So you don't even, God, please be with me. And I know that's kind of a common prayer for us, right? But we don't even have to pray that prayer. If anything, we ought to be saying, thank you, God, that you're with me. And then listen to him when you go. And see where he sends you and what he asks you to do. Signs and wonders are going to follow believers. The, the word that, that our text uses, they're going to accompany believers. They're simply going to be present. Miracles are going to take place. Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4 says, How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? If God's come into us and we're saved now, we already have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Something special should happen. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Somebody told you about Jesus, didn't they? Could have been a Sunday school teacher. Could have been mom or dad. Could have been Billy Graham. Right, Alan? Somebody told you about Jesus. 
The Lord has confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. The great high priest has been giving out his power, and God has been giving us miracles and blessings to help us know that God's alive and with us. Let me give you another example. It's Acts chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. This is the beginnings of the church. Peter's walking into the temple, and there's a beggar that's sitting there. Incidentally, take note. How long has this beggar been sitting there, this lame man, pleading with somebody to help him? Most of his life. Who walked in probably that same door of the temple? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ walked in that same doorway, walked by this same man, for some reason didn't stop to heal him. Maybe because he was waiting for Peter to do it later. Acts 3, 6 and 7, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Signs and wonders follow God's people. Paul on the island of Malta, here's why I say this is prophetic rather than a prescription. On the island of Malta, it's Acts 28, the last chapter, right? Just, as, just before we go into Acts 29, which is us. Acts 28, he's on, an, on the island of Malta. He reaches down to pick up some wood for the fire. And when he does that, a snake latches onto his hand. It's a poisonous snake, a deadly snake. The people from Malta know that it's deadly. Acts 28, verse 4, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, because, see, the ship had wrecked. The ship's totally destroyed. They've just barely made it ashore, and every one of them's been brought ashore safe. Another incredible miracle. But they look, they say, this man, he just got bit by a snake. See, he's got to be so bad that even though he made it out of the ocean, he's going to die now. This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But sh Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. Now watch out, because then you know what happened next in Acts 28? Then they wanted to start bowing down to him and worship him as God. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. No, this is just God working his way in this. I need to say a word about tongues because he's been saying you're going to cast out demons, you're going to heal the sick, you're going to speak in other tongues, uh, poisonous snakes will bite you, you they'll drink uh, poison and not die. A word about tongues. Folks, tongues is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Incidentally, some of you might start questioning, okay, okay, great, Pastor Bill's going to go charismatic on us right now. <laughs> If we are not charismatic, we're not a Christian. You say, what? To be charismatic means to be grace gifted. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, have you been gifted by grace? Therefore, you're charismatic. Right? And has not the Holy Spirit given us all supernatural gift or gifts? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, uh, Romans 12. Again and again and again, it says, we've all been given gifts. Well, some other words about the gift of tongues. The gift was given originally each time that a new group received the Holy Spirit. So at Acts 2, they received the Holy Spirit. Now notice, by the way, I think that Acts 2 was a gi different gift than the, than the other places. In Acts 2, what happened? It says that, and they all heard in their own tongue. It was a miracle of, of hearing even more than it was a gift of tongues. But later then, at Cornelius' house, the first Gentiles to become believers, the Holy Spirit fills up these Gentiles, and what happens? It says they speak in tongues. And it was an evidence. The Holy Spirit anointed them, and God did some great things that day as he reached the Gentiles. Then there was the group of Ephesians who who had only been baptized according to John's baptism, which means they had repented and they were waiting for the kingdom to come. And Paul says, well, wait a second, though. You need the baptism of Jesus Christ. 
And they said, well, well, please, yes, we want it. We want to, and he tells them about Jesus. They, we believe in Jesus. And what happens? Says Holy Spirit came upon them. They actually spoke in tongues. But take note, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 30. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Not everybody has the gift of healing. By the way, I think that even this one, take note, it says gifts of healings. God gives healings to the church. I'm not sure that he makes healers. With healers, we tend to exalt them. But God gives healings to the church. What did he do for Peter? Our Peter? He sealed up that, that you know, abdomen. That was not because Bill is a healer. Please. But God gave us and gave Peter the gift of a healing. So do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? What would the implied answer be? No. Do all interpret? Implied answer? No. They don't. But he still goes on. Chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. Some of you are saying, I didn't catch that this was about the spirit today. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets. And there's all kinds of instructions in these chapters about the use of the gift of tongues, if you're actually going to use it in worship and stuff like that. But unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. What happens here ought to be building people up, not just for me. And today, mostly, tongues has become a personal prayer language, something to build me up, not to build the church up. And if it's going to build the church up, then somebody needs to also, and I believe somebody different than the person who spoke in tongues, needs to stand up and say, here's what that, that tongue just was. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? But there's a real significant caution that comes in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39. And if you have your Bibles, you need to check this one out. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. That's a significant warning from Paul, isn't it? Prophesy, meaning preach. Talk to people. Share the good news about Jesus. Help people grow by, by sharing the word of God and expanding on that and, and going into it. That's what life groups are part of, all right? We get in there, we're trying to, to eat up the word of God together and apply it to our lives and challenge and exhort and encourage and build up one another. That's using the word of God for that purpose. But he says, and that's prophesying. But he says, don't forbid speaking in tongues. Debbie was in Czechoslovakia on a mission trip. They pulled all, the, this was back when it, we had what we used to be referred to as the Iron Curtain, communist, um, Soviet Union, and they went into Czechoslovakia and they took um, a suitcase of Bibles with them. And they came up to a s checkpoint, and the, at that checkpoint, the soldiers had them remove every piece of luggage from the bus. When they got them all out there, and these kids are like, oh no, Oh no, oh, oh no, we are in trouble because they know there's a bag right over there that's got Bibles in it. And so they're all just praying and like, do we run now? What do we do? And those soldiers started opening up suitcase after suitcase after suitcase. And they left one suitcase unopened. And it was the suitcase with the Bibles in it. Signs and wonders will follow you when you're preaching about Jesus to the world. 
Debbie will share with you that she had a really unique experience when she was on that trip as they were praying and saw miracles like that taking place. And there was one of the days that she was on the trip and she started speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, actually. And some of you are saying, I knew it. Pastor Bill's wife and he are messed up, right? <laughs> There are times that I try to listen to God carefully. There are times that I have groans that I just, I can't express everything. You know, one of those was even with Peter. Times that you pray and you just, you just can't get it out. Father God, right now, you know whatever crisis is taking place. You know who's in need, you know who's in danger protect these guys as they're traveling on scene to whatever crisis is taking place. Minister your peace, the peace that goes beyond understanding to those who are there. Show them your love and help whoever's involved, whatever's taking place, help them to know that you are real and that you're there with them. And Jesus, put people there who will show them your love. And may we be those people too, Jesus. In Jesus' name. You see, folks, God is with us. And when we pray, sometimes we need to pray. And how does it say? The Holy Spirit will speak for us with words to deep the groans. Some of us are afraid of the Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid that the reason we're afraid is that we don't want to give up control to God. And I would just urge you, God is greater, more powerful, more wise and more knowing, has all the resources of heaven available to us if we'll allow him to work through us. You see, God's with us. And if we'll allow it, people will see God in us. When we pray, God acts and people notice. William Barclay said the church has a healing task. Here's a fact we have seen again and again. Christianity is concerned with men's bodies as well as men's minds. Jesus wished to bring health to the body and health to the soul. Jesus cares about people, and Jesus wants you to care. And one of the ways you can do that is to pray with and for people. As we wrap up this part of the text, it says that, that Jesus ascended into heaven. Here we have the same thing that happened in Matthew 28. The disciples went out into the world and they changed their world after Jesus ascended. What was the difference? The Holy Spirit had come upon them. Cowards, frightened men, locked in a room, even when Jesus was already declared as being risen from the dead, they're still in hiding. But what changed? What was the evidence that God was alive, that Jesus had risen? The evidence is what the Spirit did in them to send them out in the world to preach the gospel. Acts 4, 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales. What happened? The early church, when the God left, when Jesus rose and ascended into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit back, and he empowered the church to be bold. And notice it was bold, not just in speaking, but in living. They shared what they had. They're, they're selling property even and giving it away. And God's doing miraculous things because they're allowing the Spirit to work in them. I was reading an article this week from Outreach Magazine, and they had nine different people talking about discipleship and culture in it. But the one that really hit me was two questions by Josh Patrick. He said, where is the brokenness in this city, and how can we bring the hope of Jesus to it? Where's the brokenness in Crestline? And how can we bring the hope of Jesus into Crestline and the surrounding areas around? There's a health fair coming up in just a few weeks, and there will be all kinds of agencies out there. Some of them are Christ-centered, some of them not. But Mountain Health is going to be there. 
we need to be there to meet our community, to see what the needs of people are in our community, and to see how we can care about them. Incidentally, Judy's going to be over that. Is that a pink table? Okay, there's a pink table in sanctuary today. <laughs> I didn't think you liked pink. No. <laughs> So she's going to be at the table afterwards because she needs some volunteers who would work that day. If we had, if I'd really was brave this morning, I would just walk around the whole neighborhood and preach to you out there. What we really need to do is we need to go and be in our neighborhood and see the people, get to know the people, build relationships with them, connect with them, and you earn the right to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. Go love. Well, I'm inviting some of you to go to Judy today and sign up to be there to help Mountain Health to go into our community and see what needs are in our community. Where is the brokenness in our city and how can we bring the hope of Jesus into it? And there's a second question we have. What does the ministry of Jesus look like in Crestmont? What does the ministry of Jesus look like in Crestmont? Jesus lives in every one of you who believes in him. So you are the image of his ministry here. What are they seeing? After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. And the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Where is Jesus right now? Seated. Seated at the right hand of God. Psalm 110.1, the Psalm of David says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus is sitting there at the right hand of God waiting for his return when his enemies will be placed as a footstool for his feet. You know, Jesus quoted this passage from Psalm 110. When he's speaking with the, the religious leaders, the scribes specifically, they've all come trying to question him, trying to chaff him, and it hasn't worked. And so once they're all done, I'm like, okay, we're not going to ask him anything else because it's just not working. Then he says, okay, now I've got some questions for you. And he restates this text, Luke 20, verse 41. Then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? Because he was forever beginning and end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He lived before. He will live at the end. He is Jesus. He is God. And that's what he's saying right here. In fact, Jesus will use this verse one more time. In Matthew 26, verses 63 to 65, he's on trial before Caiaphas in the middle of the night. And they cannot get any witness that is valid enough to convict him, but they know, Caiaphas knows, can't, I've, got, I've got to kill this guy. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, having been silent throughout this terrible trial, Jesus responded. You have said so. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And with that, the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. He has just declared himself to be equal with God because he says, he takes this text from Psalm and he says, look, I am seated. You're going to see me seated at the right hand of God waiting for my enemies to be placed as a footstool. And they say, blasphemy. 
Jesus is at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit's now here. And the disciples go out and they make disciples. By the way, what did Jesus say? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, now go back to Jerusalem and wait. Wait there because the Holy Spirit's going to come. Let's read that whole text. Acts 1, 1 to 12. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He says, look, Jesus showed. He, showed, he revealed himself to 500 at one time. He visited the disciples at more than one place. He ate with them. He talked with them. They touched him. They knew that he was risen from the dead, and he gave them all kinds of convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up in the same way into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. Do you believe Jesus? That he will give you the Holy Spirit to empower and equip you to be his witness. Do you believe that Jesus died, rose from the dead for you? Then as we end Mark, <laughs> get out of here. Go and make disciples. It's a command, not an invitation. And it's a command that comes with all the resources you need to do it. And don't wait until you say, well, I don't know enough yet. Really? What more do you need to know? Then go. And when you're going, make relationships with people who don't know him. And seize opportunities to let them know about what Jesus has done in your life. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit's going to be right there following and anointing and equipping and empowering you. And, yes, even signs and wonders will follow. So get out of here to the world that's dying without Jesus. Lord God, help us to do what we've been talking about now for these over two years. Go and make disciples. Lord, don't let us be so thinking we've got to have some kind of long three-year seminary program worked out that covers all the different subjects and all. Oh, God, just let us go and love people. And in the process, to pray for them and with them. To pray that their hearts would be softened, their hearts of stone would be removed and they'd be given a heart of flesh. But, Lord, we pray that for ourselves as well today that we would have our hearts broken, that we would move from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, and that anything that we're allowing to hold us back from going out into this world for you, Jesus, may that, may that be removed from our stony spots in our heart. And instead, 